Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the host for having me here. I'm, uh, I'm excited to tell this, uh, this story today. I'm very sorry that I wasn't able to be here yesterday. Um, yesterday was my day for traveling over here. But I did just come from an Indigenous Protected Area workshop in Winnipeg, where I saw a presentation about um, uh, Titan and Anna from uh, Addie Johnson, uh, sorry, Jonason. So I feel like I got an introduction to some of the work that's happening here. So I was lucky to, to be able to see that. Um, I'm a, I work with something called Eco Advisors. Um, we are a small consulting firm based in Halifax. And most of our time is spent working with governments, with companies, and with uh, organizations, uh, both uh, conservation organizations, environmental organizations, and community organizations on finding ways to uh, keep conservation efforts going in the long run. Um, and so that focuses on both institutional development and institutional design and systems, and also figuring out how to keep things funded uh, over the long term. So when talking about conservation finance, I suppose it makes sense to take a step back and say, what do I mean when I say conservation finance? And uh, Sort of the starting observation is that to keep conservation going around the world um, by governments, by communities, and everything in between, at the moment is receiving about $50 billion per year. Analyses suggest that. Did I do that? No, I just. Okay, just fair enough. Um, various studies suggest that what's needed to keep this stuff going every year is at least $100 billion, and so that would suggest that we're at a shortfall of about 50 billion bucks per year. But other analyses think it's even bigger. Up to 200 or even $400 billion per year is needed for conservation to, uh, to happen at the scale needed for, for our objectives, which means that there's an enormous shortfall. So when I'm talking about conservation finance, it's about the search for how can we solve this problem? How can we close this gap? Um, and, yeah, obviously the challenge is, is quite significant. That's a big number. Um, in terms of what are we trying to finance, what are we looking for funding for, um, there's a couple of ways to slice that pie. Um, a big one is setup costs against recurring costs. Um, setup costs are much easier to find money for. Donors like giving money to setting up a new national park, um, setting up a new visitor center, buying new uniforms for rangers, things that you can spend money on once, take a picture of, and then feel good about. The really hard thing is recurring costs, the, the basic nuts and bolts money that has to come every year. Um, and so finding ways to cover that is much more challenging. Then another way to slice it is management costs, which is a lot like those recurring costs I just mentioned, um, versus something uh, that uh, sort of an economic term called opportunity costs, which is what is the cost of what you're giving up uh, to achieve conservation? When you have an area um, that you could do conservation management in, there's other things you could do for, right? You could do logging instead, for example. So when you choose to do conservation, you're giving up logging income. So finding money to cover that opportunity cost, to, to cover the money that you would have made by doing other things, is again much harder than finding uh, financing for management costs. Um, so, those are, so, so those are some of the categories that we think about when we uh, try and tackle this problem. Um, another thing that I think might be helpful uh, to quickly say before I talk about some examples is um, often conversations about conservation financing get a little mixed up between the specific thing you're talking about. Um, and there's sort of three, three parts of the equation in, in the way that I organize it in my head. Um, first is, what's the actual conservation thing that you're doing, right? Um, then there's how do you pay for that? Where do you, or actually, where, there's, where do you find the money to make that stuff happen? Um, and finally, once you have the money, what are the mechanisms, what are the systems that you use uh, to get that money to where it needs to be? So for example, protect, creating a protected area, that's a conservation intervention. That doesn't automatically come with money. Um, many protected areas around the world, uh, part of the financing strategy is let's set up a trust fund. But a trust fund is really kind of a disbursement mechanism. It's how do you manage money and how do you distribute it? Um, so in between those two things, there's the question of how do you get money into the trust fund to begin with? So I think it's helpful to keep those three things separate, although in some situations, uh, certain kinds of interventions, you know, some of those lines are kind of blurry. Um, but maybe some of the examples will get at that. 
Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, there's a gap of at least $50 billion, and it might be much bigger, depending on how you, how you analyze uh, the needs. Um, so there's a question of why is it so hard? Um, everybody knows that conservation is important. Um, how come we don't have enough money to, to make it happen at the scale that we need? Um, and I won't belabor this because these are some, some uh, economic arguments that, end, that, can, that can get pretty academic. But a lot of the things that we're trying to accomplish uh, with conservation is something that we refer to as a public's good, public goods problem. Public goods, a certain kind of conservation value, um, have, a couple, have, have a couple characteristics that makes them hard to fund. One of them is something they call non-excludability. And what that means is if I benefit from something or if I get some value out of a certain kind of conservation result, um, there's nothing you can do to kind of stop me enjoying that value. Clean air is a good example. If there's clean air, nobody can stop me from breathing it, right? Um, the other public goods characteristic is something called non-rivalry. What that means is the more I use of it, it doesn't really take away anybody else's ability to use it as well. And again, clean air is a good example. The more I breathe doesn't really make it possible, you know, harder for anybody else to breathe. When you have those two situations, it's really hard to get people to pay for it because essentially you can get it for free. And if I don't pay for it, I'm going to get it anyway. So when you have a situation like that, it's hard to get people to pay for things and you have something that we call a missing market. There's no way to get people to pay for it. So there's no way for demand and for the fact that people want this and consider it important. There's no way to turn that into a stream of revenue. If you have that situation, then the big question becomes, can conservation really pay for itself? Can you do something with the situation that really compels people to pay for it? Or do you have to come up with alternative ways? And the typical sort of economist response to a public goods problem is, that's exactly what the role of government is, is to step into those gaps and, and, and cover them. Now we know that Governments around the world can't cover the entire bill of conservation, so that's why we have to be creative and find additional solutions. So, and this is a very busy slide, and I'm not going to go through point by point. Um, what are those various creative solutions? Um, there's sort of three big buckets that I find make this uh, clearer to think about. One is philanthropy. Um, and that's all the different kinds of conservation giving that are out there, uh, whether it's from individuals or foundations, companies. Government is obviously a big bucket and a very important one, um, which can come both from government allocating its own revenues that it has and for using tax instruments to persuade other people to either donate or to kind of reward conservation activity. And then when it comes to creative solutions, innovative solutions to financing, there's what can you do sort of with the private sector on the market front. Um, user fees, so like when people pay for coming to a national park, green enterprises like ecotourism, et cetera, a bunch of things. Um, I'll come to the, to the last set uh, toward the ends of, towards the end of my remarks as well. Um, those are kind of the categories. Philanthropy, government, and kind of market solutions. <laughs> So, with that background, I wanted to jump into a few examples. Um, the first one that came to mind that I thought would be interesting to share is an example from Venezuela. Um, it's a huge area that's important for things that, you know, for the, for the biodiversity that's there that doesn't exist anywhere else. But the key part of the example is that there's a community that lives up in sort of the northern part here of Aripao is what it's called, and they're managing 88,000 hectares, almost 100,000 hectares, trying to prevent illegal hunting, illegal fishing, illegal mining. Um, and the thing that makes it an interesting example is they've got something called serapia trees. Um, this is a tree that produces something called a tonka bean, which to me sounds like something out of a children's story, but they, um, Tonka beans produce this stuff that's very highly valued in the flavor and fragrance industry. It's used for expensive perfumes, it's used for taste in certain foods, and the best quality of this stuff comes from naturally sourced trees. So what this project does is it works with the community to do sustainable harvesting of these tonka beans, and that then is supposed to generate the financing to support their conservation activities. Uh, the stuff that they're trying to cover is Opportunity costs, like I mentioned earlier, you want to give the people incentives to do things uh, in a conservation way and to avoid destructive activities. 
There's the cost of doing the conservation. Mostly it's patrolling, uh, vigilance activities. And then there's the cost of the actual sustainable harvesting methods that they use, um, which involves some training, some specialized equipment, um, basically making it possible to harvest these, these, these magic beans. Um, the way that this is financed is there's a contribution from one of these fra uh, flavor companies, fragrance companies, Givadon. Um, so that's corporate philanthropy, right? Um, and then the other part is selling these beans is supposed to also use the market to try and create an incentive and make it possible for the community to do this conservation. The way that it's all set up though um, is that the company gives a big grant to a big international conservation organization, Conservation International, CI. CI then gives a grant to a local organization in Venezuela. The local organization works with the community. The community sells it to a company that's in Venezuela because they can't sell directly to the, the Swiss company. And so then the final step is that the Venezuelan company sells it to the big Swiss company. So the point here isn't to necessarily delve into all those details with you, but it's just that it's a little bit complicated. And the fact is, this is actually a simple version, relatively speaking, of trying to do uh, sustainable conservation finance using, um, using sales of a, of a sustainable product. Because normally, there's even more costs of monitoring and certification and getting third parties to check that it's happening in a sustainable way, et cetera, et cetera. So, point being, Sustainable sales, using the markets in that way is very complicated. And in this thing, in this particular project, most of the financing is still coming as philanthropic grants from the company, um, which is about $100,000 US per year, whereas the sales of Tonka beans are only generating about 5,000. Message basically is, it's really hard. Um, a second example that I wanted to touch on comes from Kenya, and it's, uh, an area called Loisaba, sort of right in the middle of the country. This is an area that um, was a cattle ranch. In 1997, it was bought up by a small group of young Kenyans who wanted to convert it to the tourism enterprise and do it for more sustainable land management. Um, they also are surrounded by community lands, what they call group ranches, um, who are mostly cattle raising people. Um, and in 2015, the original investors wanted out, so they sold it. And they sold it to a community organization, a community, it's called the Loisaba Community Trust, which was created for the purpose of buying this ranch. Um, the financing needs here were, first of all, the investment to get the tourism uh, operation up and running. Then in 2014, when they bought it out from the original investors, that required a huge slug of, of, of cash. Um, they need ongoing funds for, for managing wildlife in this area. And then the surrounding communities expect and need uh, investments in community development activities. So these are the, kind of the categories of things that need to be covered. Um, and so how do they do this? A lot of the investment to get tourism up and running were from impact investors. And what that means is essentially borrowing money from sources that are willing to charge lower interest rates, so to give you cheap credit, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, because those sources kind of see the environmental value of, of, of the investment. Um, the big purchase in 2014, um, where the community was able to buy out the, the tourism enterprise, that was covered by philanthropy, by grants through the Nature Conservancy. And then tied to all this, this is something called the Loisaba Community Conservation Foundation, which is there to ensure that the neighboring communities also see benefits from this. Um, and they are sustained by ongoing fundraising, uh, approaching philanthropic sources. Um, but the key thing here is tourism revenue. Uh, tourists blow about six, seven hundred dollars a night to stay at this place, and that money goes then to the local communities. So that's pretty successful. They make about 1.5 million bucks a year, and are enter entirely self-funding, at least on the tourism enterprise front, as a consequence. Um, I won't delve into the specific numbers. The key point is they are very fortunate in terms of their location and the sort of the nature that they have, that they have a ready and willing market of people willing to pay good money to, to experience uh, a visit there. The final example, and I'm try trying to 
put in way more than I actually have time for, so I'm going to skip through that example. Um, the final example relates to a trust fund. Um, there are three types of trust funds, and I know trust funds come up a lot as a conservation financing solution. Um, and the three categories that matter are revolving funds, which is a fund that's designed to keep receiving money over time and then spending it out. There's sinking funds, which typically receive one large injection of, of financing uh, of funds and then draw that down over a period of time. Um, and then there's endowments, where the idea is to raise enough money in the very beginning that it then generates enough funds to keep itself going and doesn't need additional uh, funds coming in over time. So these endowments are very exciting because it's probably the most secure form of financing that we know of. Um, it is uh, one way of, in one fell swoop, having enough money there to keep things going in perpetuity. But the big challenge is to do that, you need to raise about 20 times as much as, uh, as the annual budget. Um, in terms of sort of a rough back of the envelope calculation. When you set up an endowment, there's two choices. There's you can start up from scratch, which takes a lot of design effort, um, or you can try and find an existing fund mechanism that already exists and build it in there, which can save you some, some headaches. So an example of a trust fund uh, is in Fiji, where they established something uh, that we call the Sovi Basin. Sovi Basin is a very cool place that's kind of a, a circle of mountains, and the basin in the middle is a little over 20,000 hectares of pristine lowland rainforest with a, with a river that runs through the middle. Um, this was created as a nature reserve in a lease that's for 99 years. Um, and with that, there's an endowment to cover these costs. There's lease and royalty payments, so the community decided we're not going to do logging, but they still needed the lease payments and the royalty payments that logging would have generated. Then there's a separate stream of funds that goes to a community conservation and development trust, so specifically for community development projects. And then there's the basic cost of managing this thing as a reserve. Um, to get the endowment up and running, there are two main sources. Both of them are philanthropy, one from foundations, essentially, and the other one from a company called Fiji Water. Um, a key thing about this endowed trust fund is that the donors maintain a fair amount of control. They receive annual reports about how uh, the reserve is going and how the community development projects are going. And so it's kind of an annual audit of how the National Trust of Fiji is using that funding. And then, so depending on the performance, they can block funds in any given year to kind of force the National Trust of Fiji to improve its performance to, to keep the, the funds flowing. Um, the details here aren't what matter. The point is that there's a whole analysis that happened to see how big should this endowment be. Because um, there are several pieces that needed to be covered, and those are the pieces I mentioned a moment ago. Once you go through all that math, what you end up with is that the annual need is about 3.8 million Fijian dollars. So then converting that to, uh, uh, sorry, the annual need is 190,000 almost US dollars. Converting that, basically multiplying it by, multiplying by 20, like I said earlier, you get to 3.8 million bucks. However, we also need to think about the fact that there's inflation, so costs go up a little bit every year. And then some of those needs in that messy little diagram, those things can change at some points as well. Those can be adjusted. Um, so adding those things up, it meant that instead of needing 3.8 million to start up the endowment, we needed 4.5 million. So instead of just 20 times, which I said earlier, which is a convenient kind of shorthand, um, we needed sort of 24 times as much as the annual budget. So that's a big, a big fundraising push that's needed at the beginning. I want to quickly move ahead now to reflections that I wanted to share on the basis of some of those examples. Um, in terms of other mechanisms, beyond what I've mentioned a couple times on those examples, which were philanthropy, sort of enterprises and services and government sources, there's these other things. Impact investment, which did come up. Uh, green bonds, impact bonds, other things. Those things all boil down to borrowing money. And so I'll make another comment about that in a moment. In terms of getting a trust fund up and running, um, a thing that I 
there's two ways of going about it. I mentioned an example where you calculate how much you need, and then you go out and raise an endowment amount that tries to cover that. There's other situations, and Coast Funds is one, an example that I think came up yesterday, and there's other people here that can tell you a lot more about that than me. Um, we're figuring out the annual need is not really a starting point. What you do is you first say, okay, how much do we think we could raise in one big push at the beginning? And that's what we'll go for. Um, so some of it's just a sort of a practical response to what your situation uh, can, can accommodate. Um, another thing worth mentioning about these trust funds is the Fiji example was set up just for the Sovi Basin, but it was designed in a way so that over time, other protected areas, other national parks in Fiji, can be added to it. So the thing can grow over time and support more and more uh, uh, conservation areas. Um, the sources that I mentioned were principally philanthropy and government sources. Um, but as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, often those are not enough. Um, often there's still need for ongoing fundraising to supplement the, the initial trust fund. Um, the Venezuela example, I think a key thing there is, if you want to try and generate money through sustainable harvest of, 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 a, of a natural product, it's usually easier, or it's always easier, to find something that's already happening and add an environmental premium to that, a sustainability premium, um, than to start something totally new from scratch. Um, and that having the private sector involved makes it much more likely uh, that you'll succeed. Um, Private sector involvement means that there's already an established market and already a demonstrated willingness to pay for this stuff on the part of some audience out there, and building on that is going to be much easier than starting, starting something totally new. But the key thing for all of these things is you need a really strong pitch, a really strong story as to why your initiative merits this kind of uh, conservation investment. Um, the other things that I mentioned were, uh, that I said that I'd quickly touch on, were these investment uh, tools. And here the key thing, to borrow money to make these conservation mechanisms happen, requires that there's a stream of revenue over the long term. And that often is a very difficult thing to put up, but nobody's going to loan you money unless you can kind of show how you're going to pay it back over time, right? Um, and so that means you need to show a long-term revenue source or you need collateral or some other institution that's willing to guarantee the repayment. Um, and what that kind of amounts to is asking the question, if it doesn't work out and you can't repay the loan, what is the risk? What happens? Uh, what happens with the, um, with the conservation assets that you've kind of put up? All right, I apologize for rushing at the end there, um, but that's, uh, those are the remarks I prepared. Thank you. Um, while I get set up for the next talk, um, do we have uh, one question for, for Eddie? Um, knowing that, that we will have a panel later to harass him then as well. One question? No? All right, you're off the hook. Okay. Oh. There you go. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, biodiversity. Um, some sort of performance bond, is that, what, what, what did you call it? You just sort of quickly went through it. Yeah, I mentioned, yeah, uh, I mentioned an environmental impact bond. Yeah. yeah, so the question I have is specific to, were, were you here yesterday? I wasn't, sorry. So we talked a lot about uh, these protected areas, um, how they really sort of hit the ground in meaningful ways through guardian and, and active stewardship. So it's, these places are of course lines on maps, but what makes them really interesting to, especially indigenous and northern jurisdictions, is the stewardship component, which delivers some environmental outcomes for sure, but the primary outcomes of those types of programs are actually social and cultural. So mental health and wellness outcomes and so on and so forth. What about social outcome bonds as a way to finance conservation? Because I actually think that's probably a much better opportunity in the north with indigenous populations than it is than the environmental type performance bonds. I think that's a, that's a great point and very important to, uh, to keep in mind. I mean, first of all, on the having a strong pitch front, the social aspect certainly strengthens, uh, strengthens pitches to lots of different sources, so it's important in that regard. Um, and then when it comes to these impact bonds, 
Environmental impact bonds don't have a great track record yet. It's not something that's been used very often, and the few examples that are out there are not super successful. Whereas social impact bonds are in much wider use, and there's a much sort of better evidence base that these things can, see, can, can succeed. So yeah, I think it's absolutely true that uh, if that's how you position uh, a financing strategy, you're, or if, if you can, you're way better off. Um, there's a lot more potential there. Okay, thank you very much.